So uh, welcome to Grand Rounds, everyone. Um, our speakers today are uh, Robert Frazier and Erica Johnson, and uh, so it's kind of unusual having a tag team uh, Grand Rounds here. Uh, so um, Dr. Frazier is a professor in the departments of um, uh, rehabilitation and uh, neurology. Um, He's been here for quite a while and has had a very successful uh, academic career um, looking at the psychology of rehab and um, head injury and, uh, and in epilepsy has become a big interest for him. Um, he's been on editorial boards for, for numerous journals, has several funded uh, grants. And he's been recently working with Erica Johnson who, um, ironically, they both got their PhDs in rehabilitation psychology at the other UW, University of Wisconsin, and now they're working at our UW um, together on projects related um, to self-management of uh, epilepsy. So um, they're excited to tell you about what they're up to, and uh, without further ado, I'll hand it over to Erica and Robert. Thanks so much, Chris. Uh, I feel like I'd be, I should be Doing a little little break moves here after that last presentation. <laughs> you can. You're welcome. Yeah, well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's why it's late in the, late in the afternoon. Okay. Uh, yeah, we're uh, ner with the neuro uh, neurology vocational services. We've been at, at Harborview for decades. We'll put it that way. Uh, we started in epilepsy and then moved into thanks to Dr. Ward, and then uh, vocational rehabilitation, traumatic brain injury, and then MS, and uh, and we're doing both services and research in each area. And uh, we continue to provide services in each area, but now our, our emphasis actually is, is back to epilepsy. So we're located about two and a half blocks east of Harborview, and that's our building, 401 Broadway. It's nicely accessible and on all the bus lines. Uh, this is just a slide of, of our, our dis disability uh, types. And if I showed you the slide a year and a half ago, it would have been uh, probably 30% epilepsy, uh, which is you know, still significant. And, and maybe 25 to 30 percent TBI and now there's quite a broad range of services and, and part of that is because of, of new programs at uh, Dr. Stobie and team at the Autism Center. So 10 percent of our referrals are now in autism. Uh, the uh, Memory and Wellness Clinic at Harborview, uh, we have 19 percent of people with some cases circumscribed and in some cases you know early dementia etc but that's a growing a referral source. So the the whole uh, referral picture is, is broadening. So we truly are really neurological vocational services. Um, these are the services we offer, uh, comprehensive vocational evaluation, community-based assessment that we do. Uh, that's probably one of our biggest services, uh, increasing even this year. It's non-paid tryouts for up to 215 hours in the private or public sector. We have about 80 companies that we work with. And uh, the reality is most of us without a disability cannot do a tryout in, in, the, in the private sector. It's against the Department of Labor regs, but there is a 1993 reg, uh, Department of Labor, that if you have a disability, you can be tried out in the public sector to see if you can do a job. And that's an ideal way to transition. We obviously do job placement, and increasing service we do is job retention. A little slide on the bottom, people seem to be pretty satisfied with our services. So our placement rate is about 58% of people who are sent for placement, uh, down a little bit from year and a half ago, but it's, it's getting back up. We do typically do about 65% uh, of the people receiving job placement services. Most of them go to work in six months or less. The average time is 4.4 months. It's a little slower than it has been, but part of that is because we're getting some more complex cases. We're all taking uh, clients from the Division of Services of the Blind, some of whom also have a traumatic brain injury. The average wage was $13.30. And I, I mentioned, I think, the satisfaction across the board. Clients, uh, our referral sources and employers has been good. Um, an increasing challenge has been job retention and people keeping their job with neurological disabilities. I think since the recession, uh, the, the employment market has been a little tougher. It's, there's not that much give. It's a little bit dog-eat-dog. -dog. And so there's a lot of adversarial situations in the workplace. And we're getting more and more referrals from neuropsychologists particularly can you help this person stay on the job? Uh, accommodations, um, efforts that we do can involve the change in, in procedures. We use job coaches. We use a paid job coworker model. Um, we do changes in procedures where someone do, uh, who cannot do a certain complex function uh, is helped by another worker and, and, and he or she in turn 
uh, does something else for that worker. Uh, changes to the workstation that can be uh, organizational, that can be a color coded tool carol so that a person can keep their, their tools in sequence and get the job done efficiently and effectively. It can be some, some type of assistive technology. Uh, there's an app called BrainScan, which is very good for keeping people organized, voice activated software, OneNote, etc. And sometimes we use some combination of the above. But the, the job coaching and job site consultation is often funded by our nonprofit. We have a nonprofit called, uh, maybe not innovatively, Neurological Vocational Services, NBS. And uh, they really help pay for particularly the job coaching, the one to one coaching time that's involved. We'll do a plug for our, uh, one of our, our fundraisers, which is at the Aston Banner on the 28th of the month. It's kind of a happy hour function, 5.30 to 8.30. Uh, no cover, but our sponsors, uh, Georgetown Brewery, Stoop, et cetera, uh, donate the, the beverages, and so any beverage purchase goes to the support of our, actually, job coaches. Uh, so now moving into um, our program for uh, active consumer engagement and self-management, the PACES program. Uh, these are disclosures, um, and we've been funded by CDC for almost seven years as, as this pro uh, program and project, research project, has evolved. But we're one of eight centers throughout the country at uh, various universities, uh, Amory, uh, Arizona, Dartmouth, Case Western, etc. And it's, it's really interesting because CDC really has, you know, kind of taken up the banner uh, in, in epilepsy in, in this self-management effort, and, and we've been thrilled. Um, to work uh, for them and with them. So our liaison at CDC is just phenomenal in, in providing input and, and, uh, and guidance. Um, chronic disease self-management, as we hear about it, has actually defied a consensual definition. So there's a focus on increasing the individual's uh, ability to pr promote their health and manage the disease symptoms and minimizing the negative impact of their disability on their life functioning emotions and interpersonal relationships. Uh, the evidential review uh, uh, a few years ago by Ermel and colleagues, they looked at uh, almost 1,600 self-management cr uh, chronic condition articles. But in terms of empirical evidence, there were 13 level one, which were meta-analyses, uh, 21 level two, uh, properly controlled RCTs, and 16 uh, evidence from well-designed control trials without randomization or control groups. So chronic disease self-management programs, by the way, the, the, the grandmother really of chronic, chronic disease self-management is Kate Lorig and the Stanford group. They, they really kind of started it with, uh, with arthritis, uh, et cetera, and, uh, and then uh, things kind of took off from there. Uh, but they vary significantly as to content, delivery style, and target audience. Uh, the evidence has uh, uh, supported success in a number of settings, but there's been a reluctance to recommend one general adoption. Um, some of the issues in the research to date has been restrictive inclusion criteria that prohibits generalization, um, high dropout rates, you know, very common, particularly on some of the web-based self-management research. Real high, well, even worse if you add a chat group. People go through the, the module right to the chat group. Uh, lack of research investigation into participants' readiness for the program, a readiness to change, a general lack of an active control, and often a, a, a top-down design. In other words, we don't start with the consumer, the neurologist, the psychologist, the nurse practitioner, social worker get together and design the program, and then that's, that's, that, that is what it is. And we, we, we didn't like that. Eric is going to tell you more shortly. Um, so the basis for their effective self-management uh, intervention evidence has moved, moved beyond some of the early educational models which were principally uh, nurse, uh, nurses as nurse educator and move more into kind of psychological underpinnings, of social cognitive uh, uh, theory, uh, reasoned action, health belief, etc. And the thinking now is that interventionists, as opposed to being just educators, should be trained relative to counseling and behavioral change, so really have some uh, training in, in, uh, in psychology, behavioral change, uh, and uh, actually avoiding at the therapy level of competence. And the program curriculum should extend beyond basic knowledge acquisition to behavioral change, to goal setting and, uh, and, and goal attainment. Uh, in terms of the self-management kind of domains of functioning, there is some consistency in terms of em emphasis, obviously, on medical management, taking your medication, using medical devices, 
basically good, being a good, a good patient, role management, which is maintaining, changing, and creating new meaningful behaviors uh, and life roles in the community to, to optimize your functioning, and finally on emotional management or emotional stabilization. So I'm now going to turn it over to my uh, colleague, uh, Dr. Johnson, who's going to go more specifically into our program. Thanks, Bob. Um, so as Bob was mentioning, when we started out with our research, we decided to take a look um, more broadly at, at chronic disease self-management, but then also start to take a look at what had been done within the realm of epilepsy self-management for designing our um, our PACES program. And some of the thinking specifically within the realm of epilepsy self-management is, uh, is the observation that seizure activity is related to a number of different health-related concerns, and particularly in the area of psychosocial adjustment. So what, we, what we've been able to appreciate in the literature in terms of issues around seizure activity is medication non-adherence uh, is frequently documented. A high number of depression and anxiety days within a year can contribute to seizure activity. Unemployment and um, also as problematic underemployment, so either working at a lower wage or not as many hours as ideal for the individual. Um, perceived stigma and also elevated suicide rates. So all of these are psychosocial concerns but also then have some relation to seizure activity. And in terms of a kind of an operational definition of epilepsy self-management, what we've pulled from the literature is that this re really refers to adaptive health behaviors and different activities that individuals can perform in order to promote their seizure control and also their well-being. So in terms of our initial observations that helped uh, energize um, our thoughts around developing a self-management intervention for patients with epilepsy. We looked to an eminent program out of Europe called the MOSES program uh, and also a program out of um, California called the Sepulveda Epilepsy Education Program and found that they had nice findings in terms of affecting medical variables related to epilepsy, but not necessarily psychosocial variables. So these are two kind of epilepsy education or self-management interventions. And more recent programs that have been developed by our colleagues within the um, Managing Epilepsy Well Network um, include the Webby's program. This is an online self-management intervention. And Project Uplift, was, which was a telephone-based uh, program, have also been able to positively affect psychosocial status. So there's some, um, there is some indication of programs here that, that have been successfully developed to start working with people not only at improving mood but, um, and psychosocial variables, but their seizure status as well. Um, however, there have been a number of limitations to what we observed in the literature. So in particular, and, and Bob just mentioned this, a lot of the um, research that we looked at specific to epilepsy self-management documented pretty high dropout rates. So people are coming into these projects but not necessarily staying in them. Um, it's really unclear, as, um, as Bob had just mentioned, where the content is coming from, how it's being derived, so is it kind of the professionals deciding what the problems are and, and needs are and going from there. Uh, also the issue around participant engagement, so how many folks are getting into an online self-management program, kind of skipping past the educational part and really just looking to interact with other people with epilepsy. And then the, the last issue that we've really tried to tackle is it's been relatively unclear to date the duration of impact on these programs. So they, they have been found to positively uh, affect life for people with epilepsy, but we don't know for how long. Some of the um, earlier studies really were only just uh, following people for about eight weeks after the study. So we don't know as well what folks look like a year after a program ends. Uh, so as we started to kind of uh, bat these issues around, you know, Bob and I said to each other, you know, is there a way to get at this that we can assure that the participants in the program are having their perceived needs around epilepsy self-management met? And if we build a program based on what patients say that they want and say that they need, 
will we be any more effective at engaging them and keeping them involved in the program? So some of the first things that we did is, is we uh, dove in the literature to see what, what's out there in terms of needs assessments for individuals with epilepsy. Um, and here we're focusing on the gamut of everything from uh, medical needs, social needs, vocational, psychological needs, um, so that we could start to define problem areas for people with epilepsy. Uh, and we were able to, uh, to capitalize on a, um, on a dissertation project from the 70s that was about the best tool that we could find in the area of epilepsy self-management. There's just not been much in the area of research done since then. And we, we took our needs assessment tool, we piloted this with a couple different focus groups. We held focus groups here in Seattle. And then we ventured out to Casper, Wyoming and Medford, Oregon to see how this all pilots with folks in more rural areas as well. And uh, just to see, do we get some different sets of issues when we look at people in smaller communities? Uh, and fortunately for us, the folks in our focus group said, yep, you, you guys have hit this and these are the kinds of problems that that we have. Uh, and from there we developed that needs assessment survey, um, needs assessment tool into a survey and we initiated um, three different survey waves that I'll briefly um, tell you about. So we, we did an original mail survey to patients here in the Pacific Northwest based out of the Regional Epilepsy Center and we're uh, really excited to get a nice uh, robust response rate for, for a mail survey. We um, had a 61% patient response rate. We also tweaked a little bit of the survey and gave the same, a very similar survey to physicians, nurses, psychologists who treat people with epilepsy to get their input about what they see as needs and, and desires for folks for a self-management program. And then more recently, we replicated this survey effort with patients out of Emory University um, in Atlanta so that we could start to get a sense of how our findings generalize in other areas of the United States. And in terms of the information that we addressed in the survey itself, we were looking at, uh, at seizure and general health information, um, people's perceptions of their own health. Uh, so this was something that actually had come at the suggestion of our project advisor who uh, thought it would also be helpful to, to see how folks actually self-rate on their health. And we looked at mood and anxiety features. We asked people to rate their life problems in a number of different domains. We looked at work, at independent living, at socializing, at day-to-day -day kind of epilepsy management, problem solving, um, managing emotions and cognition, health and well-being and, and medical care, and, and just ask people on a Likert uh, style scale to respond. We also asked respondents to give us their input into their preferences on various aspects of a self-management program. Everything from where would you want a program held to what time of the day, day of the week, um, all kinds of things that would help us really hone in on developing mm -hmm. something that would be maximally appealing to patients. Uh, and finally, we asked for some demographic information. And the key findings that I want to impart with you about the survey data uh, were that we did find that the best predictors of how people felt that they were doing overall was their depression score. And so that gave us some feedback in terms of mood issues that people with epilepsy are facing. And as, as patients' mood decreases, so does their health their happiness and their life satisfaction. So this was a pretty important driver for us to start thinking about. And the second best predictor of health, happiness, and life satisfaction was a person's perceptions of their cognitive functioning. So we didn't do any objective measurement, but we asked people, what are the problems that you're experiencing in the realm of memory and language and that kind of thing? And if folks had more than a few, more than three different domains of cognitive functioning that they endorsed as being problematic, this was strongly predictive of poorer outcomes in the realm of perceived health. What we, uh, what we did when we looked at some secondary analyses is found that there was this possibility around a more impaired subgroup, so we, we detected that we had two different groups really kind of responding out of the patients. We had some who saw themselves doing pretty well. And we also um, picked up on this more impaired subgroup with um, mood complaints and cognitive concerns. This, these were some of the things that we were thinking about then as we turned to develop the content for our program. 
in terms of design preferences, so when people got back to us about what, uh, how they want the program um, delivered, the, the majority of respondents, so 49% wanted an in-person individual program. So they wanted a health provider to sit down with them individually and deliver upwards of an eight-week intervention. Um, luckily for us and our budget, um, the second most popular preference was a, a group um, format session. And this is important both in terms of cost effectiveness as, I, as I've alluded, but as we'll see when I talk a little bit about findings too, we've picked up on a kind of a social contact piece that's turning out to be important for the participants that we've studied so far. And the majority of folks said they'd like to get together uh, for an hour a week on a weeknight. They wanted the group led by not only a health professional, but also a peer who has epilepsy. And uh, the emphasis within the program needed to be educational and with this, this kind of overlay or complement of emotional coping strategies. Number of sessions, we had, um, we had some very variability in terms of how many sessions people wanted to attend, um, but the majority of folks were right around the eight session mark. So we're thinking about a two-week program where people are coming in for an hour once a week for an intervention. So when we, uh, when we set out with, uh, to start our randomized controlled trial, we recruited people primarily from the Regional Epilepsy Center here at the University of Washington. And the criteria for inclusion in the study were uh, age 18 and older, so we are focused on adults in the study. And we used the Montreal Cognitive Assessment Tool to get a real gross measure of how somebody was doing mm -hmm. cognitively. And the, the main purpose of this was to give us an idea if we were bringing anybody or, or looking at bringing anybody into the study that was too impaired cognitively to learn from um, the material. So we had a cutoff score of 21 out of 26, which is still in the mild impaired range, but not so impaired that we thought folks couldn't benefit from uh, being in the study. We assessed 134 patients for eligibility into the study, and we ended up excluding 42 of those individuals. Uh, about half of them never responded to follow-up attempts to bring them into the study. And then uh, 17 of them had a MOCA score that was below our cutoff. And so we were able to randomize 46 individuals each into the intervention and the control arm of the study. And just a brief overview here of the characteristics. So I just want to highlight that this was a you know, fairly middle-aged group, around 45 years of age. Pretty high education skew um, relative to what we see reported in the broader national literature. Although when we uh, dug in and looked at what's representative of our geographic area here, this is fairly consistent. Um, it's notable that a third of the sample indicated that they weren't working at the time they came into the study, although they desired um, to, to be working. And uh, Bob and I both thought this was kind of interesting because employment did not come up as one of the domains from the needs assessment as needing urgent attention. Uh, and household income skew was relatively high compared to what we see in the literature too. So an average of, of uh, $54,000 a year income. And just in terms of some seizure variables, so just over half of our sample reported having complex partial seizures, 41% reported having um, generalized or tonic-clonic um, seizures, and seizure frequency, this was a group that was reasonably, um, I just want to highlight the, you know, the high end of, of good seizure control here in terms of this is self-report, folks reporting less than a seizure per month at 30%, um, and 23% of our sample had been seizure-free for a couple of years at least. So the intervention itself was eight weekly sessions. We convened folks in groups of five to eight individuals for 75 minutes on a weeknight evening, and Bob and I took turns facilitating every other week with a uh, an employment counselor who works for Bob and also has epilepsy, real articulate and warm and engaging um, gentleman who I think was very instrumental in the delivery of, um, of our program. And we had this weekly focus on education and goal setting, and I'll get into the topics in a moment. And, then, and we did this kind of within the context of, of practicing and maintaining mood um, 
mood enhancement types of behaviors and coping. So content area, and I think Bob's circulating our treatment manual so you can get a sense of, uh, of what the intervention material itself looked like for folks. Our first session was on medical issues and epilepsy, so understanding some of the basics of, of seizure activity and medical treatments for epilepsy. Because of that subgroup piece that I talked to you about with the survey findings, um, in terms of mood issues, we took two weeks to talk about dealing with stress in the blues, or really depression and anxiety. So different cognitive behavioral strategies for enhancing mood and managing um, stress and worry. We had a week on managing cognitive problems, and that was more in the vein of strategies for dealing with the challenges you have, not cognitive rehabilitation from the standpoint of kind of practicing, um, you know, computer games to enhance your functioning, but more how can you adapt things in your environment to help with the challenges you're having. Community participation on a budget, so folks wanted to know how to get out and be active in their community even though they're on a limited income. Managing my medical care, which in some ways translated into developing your skills at being a proactive and helpful patient engaging with your doctor. And so really teaching people skills for planning ahead for their um, epilepsy clinic visits, about strategies for asking for additional time if they need it, having their questions outlined in advance, what kind of information to be prepared to show up with, that type of thing. Assertive communication in my disability, which really was about helping people comfortably develop a way to disclose or talk about their epilepsy. Uh, and, and we really found the key here was, was helping people develop a very succinct and comfortable sound bite that they could deliver to, you know, any, a, a dating partner, a friend, a landlord, an employer. Um, and, and the key here was really helping people rehearse this to get comfortable with it. And then the final session is on general health and well-being. So maintaining adequate nutrition, exercise routines, getting good sleep, that type of uh, thing. Um, in terms of outcomes measures, we looked at uh, the PHQ-9 is a nicely developed measure of depression that we used. We used uh, the GAD-7 for anxiety, the Quali-31 to measure quality of life, and then we used an epilepsy self-management scale and an epilepsy self-efficacy scale, uh, the latter two which help get it kind of the person's ability to problem solve around issues relating to their epilepsy. And we measured folks at baseline at the start of the program. Uh, right at the end of the program at eight weeks, um, and then we followed them for six months, which is longer than what we've seen um, others do in the intervention literature. We had a secondary focus on program evaluation information. So we asked patients to give us ratings and feedback about their favorite um, content and, and other satisfaction ratings for the program. So to give you an idea of uh, how people were faring coming into the program, um, and this is the, the entire sample, so the control and the intervention uh, group together at baseline, we had a mean rating of um, 2.8 on a perceived measure of overall health. So when we said to people, how do you think your overall health is, they, they're indicating 2.8 out of 5. Uh, life satisfaction rating was on average 2.3 out of, uh, on a 1 to 4 scale. A happiness rating was 2.6 on a 1 to 5 rating scale. And the MOCA score on average, even though we had that cut off at 21, the MOCA score on average was a 26. Um, and just as a, as a point here in terms of interpretation, these lower scores indicate higher, higher satisfaction or better ratings. Uh, in terms of baseline characteristics on some of the measures that I was telling you about, the mean depression score was an 8.4. This really is in the mild end of depression, so this is not, um, this is not indicative of any kind of um, diagnostic level of depression, and I think that's important for some of our considerations over the results. Anxiety was also pretty low, um, 5.6 on a 21-point uh, scale. The self-management score was 3.6 on a 5-point scale. Um, and self-efficacy also was, was reasonable, 7.7 .7 out of 10. Interestingly, the, uh, the Quali 31 scale was lower in relationship to these other scores. 
At eight weeks, looking at the treatment effects, we saw that our intervention group was significantly better than our control group uh, on their depression levels also on their self-management levels and certain aspects in particular self-management. So there are some um, helpful subscales in the epilepsy self-management scale. And in particular, uh, some of the meaningful changes for participants were in the realm of information management, lifestyle management, and medication management. Uh, nice change in the epilepsy self-efficacy scale and certain um, uh, some of the subscales of the Quali 31. So not only did we see a uh, positive change in terms of the overall score, um, but also on the emotional well-being subscale and the energy and fatigue subscale. So this is at eight weeks. When we looked at folks six months later, um, the, the significant change in depression had not held up. And when we dug into that a little bit deeper, it turns out that the intervention group had stayed improved on their depression scores, but the, uh, the control group had remitted. Their scores had also come back up. And, you know, we're looking at, at the suggestion that these folks were mild at most in terms of depression. That probably fits for people who needed to be activated enough to come in and make it in every week to an intervention. So I think there's some more teasing out to be done there in terms of what can we um, achieve with folks who have more significant depression. Um, and it also kind of gives us an idea that the trajectory with mild depression is that it may um, remit on its own without um, significant intervention. Fortunately, we did see some longer term changes on the epilepsy self-management scale and particularly that information management piece looks to hold up nicely over time. Uh, the epilepsy self-efficacy scale score uh, was also um, different at the six-month follow-up. And the Quali 31 overall score was no longer significant, but we did still see some changes around the energy and fatigue subscale, as well as the medication effects subscale. In terms of program engagement, so our other piece was, you know, not only can we help folks in terms of um, psychosocial changes, but can we keep them engaged and involved in a program? Um, we had a really nice attrition rate or nice retention rate um, with these groups. We, uh, we held on to over 90% of our participants, um, which relative to the 50% uh, retention rate in some of the other studies, we were pretty excited about. And we asked, when we asked folks, what was your satisfaction level, we were just asking for, um, you know, one to five Likert style um, ratings. Every module was rated at four out of five points or above. So we uh, felt that we kind of hit the mark in terms of the educational content that you're seeing in the book that we're passing around. And when we looked at the most highly rated modules, um, Epilepsy and assertive communication ha was and still continues to be the favorite module when we ask people what they, you know, what, what did you get the most out of or what did you like the most. Um, people also really enjoyed the dealing with cognitive issues uh, module and also managing my epilepsy care. So learning some strategies for how to more effectively engage with their epileptologist. Um, in terms of the program elements, so, so we asked about everything from, you know, did you like the food we served and, and the place that we held the group in and all of that good stuff. Um, all of our elements, again, were rated at four out of five or higher. Um, the highest rated elements were the, the leadership dyad, so having a psychologist partnered with a peer leader with epilepsy was um, the highest rated element. Also, the topics, our location was good. So we were at 401 Broadway, where Bob showed you the picture of the building at the start of his um, portion of the talk. And people liked the format, too. So we really had this variation of lecture style, but also um, really encouraged some discussion amongst the participants, too. When we just said to folks, what did you like the most out of this program? Um, this, this social connection piece, this meeting another person with epilepsy spontaneously is what most people reported. And um, we keep remarking how common it is when we start these groups that people will spontaneously say throughout the program, this is the first time I've met another adult with epilepsy. 
I'm so excited to finally talk to other people that are dealing with the same challenges that I am or have, you know, can, can offer some help and ideas in terms of problem solving. Um, so still appreciated, but at a much less uh, greater degree was the goal setting method that we used and also the reference materials that we provided. So those were kind of second and third in terms of what people mentioned. Um, but that meeting other folks was big. So we just published these results. They were um, featured in the August issue of Epilepsy. So if you want to be able to read a fuller description of the study, um, it is in the journal. And in my last few minutes here, I want to bring you up to speed with what we're up to now. So we'd wrapped up this um, trial, the trial data that I uh, just finished showing you in, in 2014, and have busily uh, been working at putting together our next steps and where, where we want to go next with the program. We just ended our first year of our new funding cycle. And the main priority in, in our 2015 to 2019 um, activity period is to extend and replicate our work with the PACES intervention. So now what we're hoping to do is recruit a much more diverse patient population into the study. So we've partnered with Swedish Neuroscience Institute, with Valley Neuroscience Institute, and the Epilepsy Center of Excellence at the VA Puget Sound. And uh, we're hoping, well, we are, we're, we're, we just finished our first um, intervention group, but we're hoping to really not only build on the veterans piece, but add to um, what, we, what we're learning from um, civilians here in the Pacific Northwest. Just one point. Yeah. <clears throat> in the review of, of the grant, uh, you were very excited about the, the veteran piece. Yeah. They, they really, they really emphasize that. So, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So Bob's comment is that you know we we are kind of becoming known as the veterans project within our network. Our reviewer, other uh, or our project manager, and other reviewers have been particularly excited about the veterans component. And I think there's been a real lack of attention um, paid to this group. So we are starting with some of the more formative steps with the veterans because we. Um, meaning like the focus group work and the, um, that I described to you earlier because we're suspicious that there could be some adjustments and, um, and tweaks needed for the material itself. The other thing that we're doing differently, and this is based on some of our success with a um, rural pilot that we did a couple years ago, that, that really demonstrated for us that it's possible to do this program over the phone even though that was a less popular choice in our survey data, is now when folks contact us with interest in the study, they're offered the choice of being of receiving the intervention over the phone as part of a group, um, phone-based group, or in person. And, and we're really hoping that that helps us extend to individuals who couldn't make it to Seattle every, you know, Wednesday for two months. Um, so we're excited to see what this does to, um, to show us in terms of results. And then this time around, we're planning a longer follow-up period. So we're going to uh, hang out and follow these folks for a year uh, rather than six months and, and hope to get a better, um, finer look at what that trajectory around depression is. Um, the question is up in the air because, as I said, the, the folks that you know, that kind of marshaled it up to come into the study in the first place were only mildly depressed, but um, it's certainly a worthwhile question for us to be entertaining. Um, once we finished the, uh, the randomized control trial projects that I've described to you, we've also, in the later two years of our project, have um, taken on the, I think, fun and interesting work of figuring out effective marketing and dissemination strategies. So, if we know this program works, how do we get this out into the um, broader uh, network of epilepsy centers or, um, or even neurology clinics? But also, how do we make this sustainable? How do we make this, um, a, you know, a viable type of service for patients? Uh, and some of our thinking so far is around training trainers who then are responsible for helping maintain um, uh, the expertise of the leaders as well as recruiting um, folks into groups. So thinking about in-person training, online or e-learning, and self-paced training materials. 
these are some of our formative thoughts. They're not commitments that we need to um, jump too solidly into for another uh, couple of years here. And uh, we have got a really extensive list of, of people to thank and acknowledge um, on our work in this project. So uh, while I described what Bob and I have been doing in terms of the intervention, we've had some extremely thoughtful um, input and real tangible support in terms of referrals and um, championing of our program. Um, so Dr. Miller here at the Regional Epilepsy Center has been um, a very facilitative collaborator. Uh, we've got some other staff here listed at the University of Washington and then um, Chris and our other partners out in the, out in the community. And, yep, I have time for questions. We have time for questions. Thank you. I skipped that point. Yeah, thanks, Bob. So Bob was um, um, drawing attention back here to the last point. So not uh, with the current trials, we're not only following people for a year, but we've engaged the services of the Epilepsy Foundation Northwest Hope Mentor Program. So this is a peer mentoring program, and we'll be having the um, peer mentors contacting the intervention participants about every six weeks or so uh, to call up, offer support on the goals they're pursuing since goal attainment was a big part of the intervention, offer informational support, answer questions, that kind of thing. And we're interested in seeing does this, does this intermittent contact help with sustaining the benefit of the program over time. missed it at the beginning. What did your control group uh, include? What did they do? They didn't do anything. They, we, we said keep doing what you're doing. Um, so it was an inactive um, control group. They obviously had some contact from us, but we weren't having them do anything other than what they would normally do. And then what we did is we, uh, neither Bob nor I felt very good about bringing people into a study where we were intervening and have them not get anything. So we offered everybody a condensed, everybody in the control group, a condensed workshop of the same information. Um, although our response rate on that was pretty low. Yeah, probably about 35% were coming from the yeah. um, But uh, everybody gets the material and uh, everybody gets a stipend. So it was a $200 stipend whether you're in the private group. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I guess I was asking because your the numbers were social benefits that they got were so high, mm -hmm. I wonder is if you would use a control group of just a bunch of people to get together and socialize yes. about epilepsy, how that might have changed the numbers. Absolutely. And in, in some joking and not so joking ways, when Bob and I would muse over what we think the therapeutic factor is, we wondered if we could get away with, you know, what would happy hour look like versus an intervention? I don't know that the CDC is going to fund happy hour for us, but it's it's a highly relevant comment, especially around the social piece. Yeah, so what is the curative or beneficial factor here, and can you achieve the same thing by letting folks get together and socialize? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Yes. I am sure you run into those people who come to you or are referred to you saying they will not take medicine, they hate pills, they want something mysterious, whatever, done to their epilepsy. Mm -hmm. They're a hard bunch to handle in, in dealing with them individually. Have you had any luck in helping that group of people? That's, that's a good question. So the question really is, have we had any luck with the folks who come in and really don't want to be on any kind of medication or who really want to be married to alternative or natural remedies? Um, we, had, we did not measure medication adherence in terms of whether people went on or stayed on um, their medication. I, I know in a handful of respects, we certainly the thing that came up routinely in each um, in each session around managing my epilepsy was 
coaching people around not going off of their medication without having a conversation with their doctor. So, and I, I don't have any data kind of off the top of my head about that, but that seemed to the, be the more frequent conversation we were having, is people saying, I'm just fed up with the side effects, I think I'm going to start going off of my medication and us intervening and coaching them towards a model of setting up a time to talk with their doctor about that or about other approaches. So there Chris. is a, you know, for your participants, there's a pretty wide range for how severe their epilepsy was or how well it was controlled. Yeah. I mean, I know you may not have the numbers for this, but was there any sense that um, some of the response was coming more from the people that are more severely affected or versus the people that are well controlled? Are you able to um, parse out who's enjoying the biggest benefit from this at all? You know, that that's a good question. When we took our first pass at looking at what predicted a benefit from the program, we did not see that seizure severity played a role, but I think it is something that we should continue to examine, um, especially with these new trials moving forward. And there was no difference in seizure severity? Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -mm. And um, the other um, quick question was, do, you know, many of these people probably don't drive and to be brought with the family. Are the family members allowed to participate, or do you, if they are, do what kind of benefit or influence does that have? It's such a good question. We, for the trial, I for the series of trials I described, I don't think we had any significant others coming in. We had a parent that was dropping a um, adult child off, uh, and we. How do I want to put? We didn't dissuade anybody from bringing in a significant other. Folks just didn't do it. Um, and and we've had some discussion around what would you do in that situation? You know, should we bring family members in to be part of this, or at some point down the line, is there space for or need for a separate like caregiver family support yeah. group that's different? I don't know if you wanted to add to that, Bob. Um, just don't leave it open. It seems like the participants kind of want to be on their own. Yeah, yeah, that is a good point. Most people have brought it up, but then there's someone that the person wants to come by myself. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's what I was wondering because, you know, certainly in clinic, um, for many of our patients, it's the um, spouse or significant other that's kind of sometimes kind of runs the show. Yes, yeah, um, yeah, and that, no, and that is a good point that so, yeah, then having some increased opportunity at a little independence and, and kind of their own thing maybe at play. Yes? Yes, I have a question for, I guess, Dr. Frazier. Um, just a pragmatic question about referring patients to your clinic. Is that is that something we can just put in, say, for the stroke clinic or wherever through Oh, for vocational? Yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah it's our Fraser at uw.edu. But one thing we do do is we take new people every Tuesday at 401 Broadway at 1030. So you don't have to make a referral. You just say, here's the brochure, or here's, here's the address, 401 Broadway, room 2088, every Tuesday morning at 1030. What we mostly do is get funding for them through state folk rehab. Like, for example, somebody saw me uh, this Tuesday. And I made two referrals, one to Bellevue for next week and one to Mercer. So we get funding for it. Uh, so we get through the book about we do the job placement. Um, so so it's kind of one stop shopping. So they come to see us ten thirty on Tuesday morning, we, we, we start the wheels rolling. And are you what's your relationship to rehab in this regard? Or are, are I'm I'm a I'm a professor in rehab medicine. Okay. But I, I direct neurological both services. That's been my primary job, and, and obviously it's a need to do it. So we wouldn't put in a referral necessarily? It doesn't have to come, it doesn't have to come to me. It's just, because well, we have a staff of, of, of eight or nine people. So if they come in at, at 10.30 on a Tuesday morning, room 2088, uh, they'll, they'll be seen. And then we'll get, we'll get funding for them. Okay. Thank you. By the way, they, we also have a, a handout on, uh, on the epilepsy self-management program, we're actively recruiting, uh, and just you could just email me at rfraser, F-R-A-S-E-R, at uw.edu, and we'll, we'll follow up and send you the patient information. Perfect. So just a repeat for folks that are online that um, intake for Neurology Vocational Services Unit for uh, referrals on the vocational services is every Tuesday morning at 1030 at 401 Broadway. 
Suite 2088, and we're currently recruiting for our PACES intervention trials. And uh, Bob's email is rfraser at uw.edu. I'm Erica J, E-R-I-C-A-J at uw.edu. Either one of us will happily enroll your patients in our study. All right, any other questions? Oh, thank you. All right. No? We answered them all, and we're five minutes early. Yeah. <laughs> thank you all for coming. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks very much. Thanks for having us.